Lord Jesus Christ, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. You are good. Give to us good thoughts, ideas, discipline. In Jesus' name, amen. We're with Dr. Millard Erickson. His Christian theology. We're talking about inspiration. We've talked about theories of inspiration, how to formulate a doctrine of inspiration. And now he's talking about the intensiveness of inspiration. We'll be talking about a model of inspiration. And uh, that will bring us to an end. We must ask about the matter of the intensiveness of inspiration. Was it only a general influence, perhaps involving the suggestion of concepts, or a thoroughgoing? one that extends even to the words. When we examine the New Testament writers of the Old Testament, an interesting feature appears. We sometimes find indication that they regarded every word, syllable, and punctuation mark as significant. At times the whole argument rests upon fine points in the text that they are consulting example in John 10 35 Jesus rests his argument upon the use of the plural number Psalm 82 6 if he called them gods to whom the word of God came scripture cannot be broken you say of him whom the father consecrated and send to the world you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God Matthew 22 32 his quotation of Exodus 3 6, and the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The point depends upon the tense of the verb and leads to the conclusion he is not the God of the dead but of the living. Verse 44, the main point of the argument, hangs upon a possessive suffix. The Lord said to my Lord, in this last case, Jesus expressly says that when David spoke the words, he was inspired by the Spirit. Apparently, David, apparently, said he had got a lot of problems with him. This is not the best systematic. David was led by the Spirit to use the particular forms he did, even to the point of detail, as minute, as the possessive, my Lord. Same quotation occurs in Acts 2, 34 and 35. And in Galatians 3, 16, Paul makes his argument rest on the singular. Genesis 12, 7. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, which is Christ. Since the New Testament writers considered the Old Testament minutiae authoritative, as what God himself said, they obviously regard the choice of words and even the form of words as having been guided by the Holy Spirit. One other argument regarding the intensiveness of inspiration is the fact that the New Testament writers attribute to God statements in the Old Testament which in the original are not specifically ascribed to him which in the original, a notable example is Matthew 19, 4 to 5, where Jesus said, Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? It then proceeds to quote Genesis 2, 24. <clears throat> in the original, however, the statement is not attributed to God. It is just a comment on the event of creation of a woman from a man. But the words of Genesis are cited by Jesus as being what God said. Jesus even put these words in the form of a direct quotation. Evidently in the mind of Jesus, anything the Old Testament said was what God said. Other instances of attributing to God words that were not originally ascribed to him are Acts 4.25, quoting Psalm 24.22. Psalm 2, 1 and 2, Acts 13, 34, quoting the psalm. 
16.10, and Hebrews 1.6, quoting Deuteronomy 32.43, and Psalm 104. In addition to these specific references, we should note that Jesus often introduced his quotations of the Old Testament with the formula, it is written. Whatever the Bible said, he identified as having the force of God's own speech. It was authoritative. This, of course, does not speak specifically to the question of whether the inspiring work of the Holy Spirit extended to the words. These guys just were really unhappy with this book. But we'll soldier on, God helping. But it does indicate a thoroughgoing identification. So he gives with the one hand and then takes with the other. Now, the basis of this didactic material, one would conclude that the inspiration was so intense that it extended even to the choice of particular words. If, however, we are to take into account the phenomena of Scripture, the characteristics of the book, then we find something a bit different. Dewey Beagle has developed a theory of inspiration based primarily upon phenomena. That's in his scripture tradition and infallibility. He notes, for example, that in the Bible there are some chronological problems which are very difficult to harmonize. The reign of Pica is the most prominent one. The chronology of Abraham is another. Beagle notes that in Acts 7-4, Stephen refers to Abraham's leaving Haran after his father died. We know from Genesis that Terah was 70 at the birth of Abraham and died in Haran at the age of 205, 1132. Abraham, therefore, was 135 at the age of his death. However, Abraham left Haran at the age 75, Genesis 12:4, which would be some 60 years before the death of his father. On the basis of such apparent discrepancies, Beagle concludes that there are certainly is no authoritativeness of specific words. That would involve dictation. Beagle also observes that quotations from non-biblical books are to be found in the New Testament. Jude 14 quotes 1 1 9. Jude 9 quotes the Assumption of Moses. These two cases present a problem for the argument that quotation in the New Testament indicates the New Testament writer's belief in the inspiration and consequent authority of material being quoted. For if authoritativeness is attributed to Old Testament material by virtue of quotation in the New Testament, should it not be attributed to these two apocryphal books as well? Beagle concludes that the quotation in the New Testament is not sufficient proof of inspiration and authoritativeness. Well, we move on from that to a model of inspiration. If we are to maintain both types of considerations, it will be necessary to find some way of integrating them. In keeping with the methodology stated earlier, we will give primary consideration to the didactic. This material concluding that inspiration extends even to the choice of words. Inspiration is verbal. <coughs> we will define what that choice of words means, however, by examining the phenomena. Note that in concluding that inspiration is verbal, we have not employed the abstract argument based on the nature of God. That is the contention that God is all knowing, all powerful and precise, and inspired the Bible, it must be fully his word, even down to the choice of particular terminology. Rather, our case for verbal inspiration is based upon the didactic material, the view of scripture held and taught by Jesus and the biblical writers not upon an abstract inference from the nature of God. 
an important point to notice is that the words versus thoughts issue is an artificial issue. The two cannot really be separated. A particular thought or concept cannot be represented by every single word that happens to be available in the given language. There's a limited number of words that will function effectively. The more precise the thought becomes, the more limited is the number of words which will serve the purpose. Finally, there is a point where only one word will do if the match of word to thought is to be precise. Note that we are not here talking about how specific the concept is. Rather, we are talking about the degree of clarity or sharpness of the thought. We will refer to the former as the degree of specificity or detail, and the latter as to the degree of precision or the focus. As the degree of precision increases, there is corresponding decrease in the number of words that will serve to convey the meaning. It is our suggestion here that what the Holy Spirit may do is to direct the thoughts of the scripture writer. The direction effected by the Spirit, however, is quite precise. God being omniscient, it is not gratuitous to assume that his thoughts are precise more so than ours. This being the case, there will be within the vocabulary of the writer one word that will most aptly communicate the thought. By creating the thought and stimulating the understanding of the scripture writer, <coughs> the spirit will lead him, in effect, to use one word rather than another. <coughs> While God directs the writer to use particular words, <coughs> the idea itself may be quite general, or quite specific. This is what linguist Kenneth Pike has called the dimension of magnification. One cannot expect that the Bible will always display maximum magnification, magnification or in great detail, or rather express just that degree of detail or specificity that God intends. And on that magnification, just a concept of which he intends. This accounts for the fact that scripture is not so detailed as we might expect or desire. Indeed, there have been occasions when the Holy Spirit, to serve the purpose of a new situation, moved a scripture writer to re-express a concept or thought on a more specific level than the original form. Figure 4, which is up above here, helps to illustrate what we have in mind. The figure depicts various levels of specificity or detail of magnification. The dimension of specificity involves vertical movement on the chart. Suppose the concept under consideration is the color red. The idea has a particular degree of specificity, no more, no less. It is neither more specific nor less specific. It occurs in a particular location on the chart. Okay, it's just a lot of goes from this to this. It is our contention here that inspiration involved God's directing the thoughts, the writers, so that they were precisely the thoughts that God wished, that he, the writer, wished to express and God wanted them to express times these thoughts were specific, at other times they were more general. When they were more general, God wanted that particular degree of specificity recorded, and no more. At times greater, specificity might have been distracting, at other times more important. The concept of propitiation, for example, is a very specific concept. To determine the degree of specificity is helpful to be able to work with the original biblical languages and to be careful exegesis. 
Now, a <coughs> degree of specificity is important because in many cases it bears the type of authoritativeness which should be ascribed to a particular passage. At times, the New Testament writers applied a biblical truth in a new way. They interpreted it and elaborated it. That is, they made it more specific. At other times, they retained and applied it in exactly the same way. In the former case, the form of the Old Testament teaching was not normatively authoritative for the New Testament believer. In the latter case, it was. In each case, however, the account was historically authoritative. That is, one could determine from it what was said and done and what was normative in the original situation. Thus, for example, the exact form of the message of Leviticus was significant in informing the New Testament writer what was binding upon the Old Testament people. On the other hand, the exact form of Leviticus may or may not have been normatively binding upon the New Testament writers. We have concluded that inspiration was verbal, extending to the very choice of words. It was not merely verbal, however, for at times thoughts may be more precise than words available. Such, for example, was probably the case with John's vision on Patmos, which produced the book of Revelation. At this point, the objection is generally raised that inspiration extending to the choice of words necessarily becomes dictation. Answering this charge will force us to theorize regarding the process of inspiration. Here we must note that scripture writers, at least in every case where we know the identity, were not novices in the faith. They had known God, learned from him, and practiced the spiritual life for some time. God, therefore, had been at work in their lives for some time, preparing them through a wide variety of family, social, educational, and religious experiences for the task they were to perform. In fact, Paul suggests that he was chosen even before his birth suggests what an awful verb you've picked there, Millard. He who has set me apart before I was born has called me through his grace. Through all his life, God was at work, shaping and developing the individual author. So, for example, the experiences of the fisherman Peter and of the physician Luke were creating the kind of personality and worldview that would later be employed in the writing of the scriptures. It is sometimes assumed that the vocabulary which is distinctive to a given writer is the human element in scripture, a limitation within which God must necessarily work in giving the Bible. From what we have seen, however, we know that the vocabulary of the scripture writers was not exclusively a human factor. Luke's vocabulary resulted from his education, broad sweep of his experience. In all this, God had been at work preparing him for his task. The vocabulary of Luke was the vocabulary that God intended him to have and use. Equipped with this pool of God-intended words, the author wrote, Thus, although inspiration in the strict sense applies to the influence of the Holy Spirit, at the actual point of writing, it presupposes the long process of God's providential working with the author. Then at the actual point of writing, God directs the thinking of the author. Since God has access to the very thought processes of the human, and in case of the believer, indwells the individual in the person of the Holy Spirit. This is no difficult matter, particularly when the individual is praying for enlightenment and displaying receptivity. 
The process is not greatly unlike mental telepathy, although more internalized and personalized. But it is such, but it, but is such thought control possible short of dictation? Remember that the scripture writer has known God for a long time, was immersed in the truth already revealed and has cultivated the life of devotion. It is possible for someone in this situation, given only a suggestion of a new direction, to think the thoughts of God. Edmund Husserl, the phenomenologist, had a devoted disciple and assistant, Eugen Fink. Fink wrote an interpretation of Husserl's philosophy, upon which the master placed his approval. It is reported that when Husserl read Fink's article, he exclaimed, it's as if I had written it myself. Give a personal example. A secretary had been with a church for many years. At the beginning of my pastorate there, I dictated letters to her. After a year or two, I could tell her the general tenor of my thinking, and she could write my letters using my style. On one occasion, I brought in a letter which I had co-authored with the finance committee chairman. She was so familiar with the vocabulary and style of each of us that she, a seminary graduate, successfully did source criticism on it, identifying the M and the E document. By the end of the third year, I could have simply handed her a letter which I had received and told her to apply. Since we had discussed so many times issues connected with the church, that she actually knew my thinking on all of them. The cases of Eugene Fink and my secretary prove that it is possible without dictation to know just what the other person wants to say. Note, however, that this assumes a closeness of relationship and a long period of acquaintance. So a scripture writer, given the circumstance which we have described, could, without dictation, write God's message just as God wanted it recorded. There are, of course, portions of the Bible where it appears that the Lord did, in effect, say right. This is particularly true in the prophetic and apocalyptic material. The fact that this is sometimes called the case should not, however, cause us to doubt that the process described above was the usual and normative pattern, nor should it cause us to regard the prophetic and apocalyptic material as more inspired than the rest of the Bible. Furthermore, while we have already noted that there is in direct contrast to passages which show evidence of dictation, some material in scripture which is not specially revealed. Such biblical material is not without God's inspiration. There's no sp special correlation between the literary genre and inspiration. That is, one genre is not more inspired than another. While we sometimes discriminate among the portions of scripture on the basis of their different potentials, for edifying us in the various types of situations that does not reflect different degrees or types of inspiration. <coughs> While the Psalms may be <coughs> more personally satisfying, inspiring than First Chronicles, that does not mean that they are more inspired. Inspiration is present irrespective, irrespective of immediate applicability. While inspiration conveys a special quality to the writing, that quality is not always easily recognized and assessed. On the one hand, the devotional materials in the Sermon of the Mount have a quality that tends to stand out and can fairly be easily identified. In part, this is due to the subject matter other cases, however, such as the historical narratives, 
the special quality conveyed by inspiration may instead be a matter of the accuracy of the record. The fact that we might be unable to identify the quality of inspiration within a particular passage should not alter our interpretation of that passage. We must not regard it as less authoritative. All scripture is verbally inspired and should be interpreted accordingly. Verbal inspiration does not require literal interpretations which are obviously symbolic in nature, such as they who wait for the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles. It does require taking very seriously the task of interpretation and making an intelligent, sensible effort to discover the precise meaning that God wanted conveyed. Inspiration is herein conceived of as applying to both the writer and the writing. In the primary sense, it is the writer who is the object of inspiration. As the writer pens the scripture, however, the quality of the inspiredness is communicated to the writing as well. It is inspired in the derived sense. This is much like the definition of revelation as both revealing and revealed. See page 196. We have observed that inspiration presupposes an extended period of God's working with the writer. This not only involves the preparation of the writer, but also the preparation of the material used. While inspiration in the strict sense probably does not apply to the preservation and tra transmission of the material, the providence which guides the process should not be overlooked. In this chapter, we have considered the question of method that have chosen to construct our view of inspiration of the Bible by emphasizing the teachings of the Bible regarding its own inspiration, while giving an important but secondary place to the phenomena of Scripture. We've attempted to construct a model that would give due place to both of these considerations. Certain other issues raised in the early part of this chapter will be dealt with on the chapter on inerrancy. These issues are one, whether inspiration involves the correction of errors which might have been present in the sources consulted and employed. Two, whether inspiration involves God's directing the thought, the writing of the author on all other subjects with which he deals only on the more religious subjects. As the Bible has been inspired, we can be confident of having divine instruction. The fact that we did not live when the revelatory events and teachings first come does not leave us spiritually or theologically deprived. We have a sure guide. We are motivated to study it intensively since it's God's message truly to us. Our section, glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.